Welcome and thank you. We're very grateful to you for joining us tonight and for being part of our community. My name is Elric Walker. I'm a board member of the Young Association of Western Massachusetts. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our association. Um, we are an all volunteer organization that was founded in 1996, concerned with promoting and exploring in community with others. The ideas of the great depth psychologist, Carl Gustav Jung. As an all volunteer organization, we very much depend and rely on you as part of our community and in the spirit of volunteering um, to help us to meet our financial obligations in bringing you this monthly series. So um, I'm gonna ask you to please consider making a donation tonight. Um, we do suggest a $10 donation. If you're able to give more, we would appreciate that. If you are able to give less, <laughs> we're appreciative of that as well. And if you are unable, you are still welcome. Um, now, to do that, uh, you will look for the chat button on your screen and click on that. And once you go into the chat room, you will see uh, a link for making a donation. I would suggest that now would be a very good time for you to go and do that. So I'd encourage you right now to go into the chat room uh, and make the donation while I speak. Um, I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to our board and to thank them for all the hard work they do on behalf of the association. The president of our association is Erica Lorenz. Our secretary is Christine Olson. Mark Iowanicki is our marketing strategist. Penny Tarasuk is our beloved advisor. Ed Tick is also a beloved advisor and program director. Judy Hall is our bookkeeper. And it is my honor to work on public relations on behalf of the association. Many kind thanks to Andy, uh, who is here tonight providing Zoom and technical assistance. Thank you very kindly, Andy, for all that you do. Tonight will be the, um, the last lecture for this series. We will resume in the fall um, and we will have um, some wonderful speakers of great interest to present to you next season. Um, please visit our website. That's where you will find information about upcoming lectures and other events. We also have an archive on the website, a video archive, and there you will find um, lectures from the, that have been presented previously and also some special events, um, including The Handless Maiden, which I participated in with Christine Olson and others. And uh, I would suggest that's a wonderful one to go and look at at the website. The website uh, you will find at westmassyoung.org. Uh, or you can just use the Google machine uh, and look up Jung Association of Western Massachusetts. And now, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Erica Lorenz to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Elric. Um, we're very pleased to have Thomas Moore with us. He actually lived in this area for a good while, I believe, and had a small partial practice in Amherst. And I'm not sure when you moved up north, but um, yeah, we were hoping to do this at Sealy Hall, but not yet. So maybe next time. Thomas I, doesn't need a lot of introduction. Probably most of you have know him. He wrote, he's written 29 books in 30 years. That's quite amazing. And to me, Thomas is a very a deep part of the lineage of Jung because Jung was very uh, focused on the embodied soul. And that was the way he worked. So thank you, Thomas, and you take it away. 
Thank you, Erica. So uh, I'd like to expand a little bit just to establish my relationship with Western Massachusetts, what, what happened there. Uh, when I, I was teaching at the Southern Methodist University in Dallas, and that's where I was very active with the Young Society there and uh, very close to James Hillman and people who came to study with him. A lot of people came from all over the world to study and I often housed them, gave them a room in my, my big uh, apartment there. And, uh, and then I, I decided to, uh, to leave Texas, I thought, <clears throat> I didn't know if I wanted to spend my, my life in Texas. I just not from that part of the world that it wasn't exactly at home. So I thought of moving to New England because mainly because of my uh, fellow friends and compatriots there, uh, Emerson and Thoreau and mm -hmm. uh, Margaret Fuller, Emily Dickinson. Uh, they've been so important to me. Uh, I read them almost every day, those writers. And they're not far from me, you know. Uh, Margaret Fuller is just a short distance from my home. And I used to live uh, in Shutesbury, which was uh, an easy drive, almost a walk down to uh, Emily Dickinson's house. Mm -hmm. So, and I also I wanted to just mention that uh, for those of you in Northampton, that uh, I used to go over to Northampton and give talks on Jung and myth in a room just above Fitzwillie's. Uh, nice little space there that I liked very much. I liked especially going through the bar on the way to my teaching assignment. It was kind of, seemed very appropriate somehow. And uh, so that's my background there. I'm very, very, uh, very much attached to uh, Western Massachusetts. I loved living in West Oakridge very, very much. I was just out there two days ago, or no, a week ago, I guess now. A uh, good friend of mine, I don't know if you know him, Chris Bamford, uh, lived in the uh, Berkshires. He and I were very, very close, and uh, he just died this morning. Mm. So uh, he's someone I would recommend if you're looking for someone to read about the spiritual life. He's very, very good. He was a publisher, Lindisfarne Books, and other things. Very, very fine man, and very, very close friend of mine. So I have him in mind as we uh, talk tonight. I want to talk to you about therapy, and it's not easy to express what I want to get across to you. I'm going to try probably different ways. Not easy to find the right language. But what I want to say is that there are certain words in history, words especially in the spiritual traditions of the world, that are very profound and they're more like words of magic rather than meaning. Uh, for example, in uh, many places in the world, the word dharma is very difficult to define. Uh, dharma means, sometimes it means the rule that a community follows, or it might be the dharma of your life, the kind of the guiding principles of your life. It could be the, 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 rule, the rule of the world, how the world works. And, you are asked and invited to be part of that, to enter into that way of life, the meaning of, of the world itself. So Dharma is one of those words, very, very special and magical. Another one is Logos. Logos is one of these magic words. It's not a word just of meaning. It means, its meaning is so profound. You use it more like a magical word. And uh, it is used by the Greeks. It was used to mean the stories that they told. There was uh, uh, the word logos in the plural, logoi, could mean the stories, the myths, the mythologies that were told. The word logoi was used by the Greeks a lot for that. The logos also meant the, the, the fact that the world is not random. It has meaning. It holds together and we could discover meaning in the world, how, how it's patterned, how it goes together. I think the study of the archetypal nature of experience is that. It's like trying to find the logos. The, the Greeks did use the word archai, meaning 
the, the basic things in life. What are, what are the, what is the basic thing in life? Uh, one, one philosopher might say it's water and someone else says fire. And they don't mean those words in very big ways. So logos is a big word. And even in, in the gospel of John, it is used at the very beginning. The gospel of John begins, in the beginning was the logos. And the logos was with God. It's a pretty powerful statement about logos. And yet logos is in our word psychology. The logi of psychology is logos. Sometimes people say psychology is the study of the psyche. Well, it's more than that. It's not the study of, it's the profound mystery, the great power in life that's related to the psyche. So when you're doing psychology, it's the most profound thing you can possibly imagine. We have reduced that word to a simple, you know, mechanistic meaning, but its, it's original meaning gives us, gives us so much depth. Well, I place the word therapy in that group. I think the word therapy ought to be experienced that way, felt that way, as a word that is profound, that has to do with the very nature of things. Just as profound as Logos and Dharma, uh, very, very profound. So here we have our word psychotherapy. So psycho is, comes from the, a Greek word that means soul. It doesn't mean mind. They had other words for mind. It doesn't mean mind. It's not the study of the mind. It's not about, it's not mental health. Psycho, so psychotherapy has to do with uh, the soul. And the therapy part of it is very mysterious too. It doesn't mean just to make better or to repair or fix. There are two meanings that the Greeks had for this word therapy. One was care and the other was serve. Care and service. Later in time in history, the word came to mean like a more of a medical treatment, but that was very late. So one of the people I read, and I recommend him to you, I really do recommend that you read Plato, the philosopher Plato. He writes a great deal about the soul. And reading this philosophy doesn't have to be like going to school, or it doesn't have to be dry and complicated. Uh, he because Plato writes in dialogues, he writes little plays, conversations, usually between Socrates and somebody else. They're very entertaining. There's nothing more enjoyable than the Plato Symposium, which is a drinking party. That's what symposium means. And everyone at the party stands up and tells people what they think love is. I think we could all use the dose of that, that kind of a party. As a matter of fact, in history, Plato's birthday was celebrated on November 7th. And people gathered together to give little talks about love, what they understand love to be. We've done that in our family. And some of my friends, when they hear about this, do it. On November 7th, they gather friends together, come over just for a meal, something to drink. And each, one, each person stands up and says, this is what I think love is all about. It's reenacting Plato's thoughts. So I, I actually, you know, I find there's a lot more depth and meaning in these very old writings than in the modern ones. I don't, I never read modern psychology. I don't, it has no appeal to me. But I do love to read Plato about the soul and about therapy because he does also write about therapy. And one of the things he says in one of his dialogues, he says, the student says to Socrates in this little play, he says to Socrates, what do you mean by therapy anyway? And Socrates says, well, I'll give you an example. If you were a farmer and you had horses in your farm, what would you do? How would you care for them? He said you'd you know, give them some give them food and drink and exercise and brush them down. That is therapy. That's what therapy is in its essence. That's what therapy is. Now imagine doing that for your soul. 
imagine bringing your soul to somebody and say, I'm, I, feel a, I feel an anxiety deep in my soul. It's so deep, I can't say that it's just mental, mental problem. It's very deep in my soul. And maybe it, I can see that it has some relationship to my life, especially when I was younger, my life when I was younger. That's like embracing your whole being then. And that's, that's, I think, closer to the meaning of therapy. It's what I would call the platonic meaning of therapy. And I think that's where Jung was. Jung was a Platonist. Jung, Jung really he knew Plato and he, he wrote about him frequently. And he understood this whole thing, what I'm talking to you about. He, ta- he writes about it himself. And, and he teaches us, I think, to be one of these profound therapists, not someone who just does counseling for the management of your life so that it goes smoothly. That's far from what Jung did. Jung really got down into the mystery, not only of what it is to be a human being, but the mystery of what it is to be you. The mystery, isn't it a great mystery? I often wonder how therapists can possibly do their work. People are so mysterious. They're bottomless. How can you, how can you really talk to them effectively? It's not easy because they are so complex, it's so deep. It's very hard to know a person and to know what's going on. And what is your role then? If you can't really know the person totally, what is your role? Well, it seems to me that one of the roles of the therapist is to, and by the way, I get these ideas now from Hillman in his book, uh, Healing Fictions, um, that one way to begin the therapeutic process is to transform wild feelings and deep, difficult feelings and passions into narrative form. It's like giving it an art form. Doesn't have to be narrative, but that's what we usually do. In other words, we, we make a story or we find stories about it. We ask people to tell their stories. That's very important for a therapist to know. I, I think that the main skill a therapist needs is to be able to elicit stories and to continue talking about narratives so that the narrative gets more complex and moves in new directions. Hillman says in that book that therapy is finding a new narrative. It's like exploring the edges of the stories you've always told about yourself. A lot of times the stories that you tell about yourself are confining. They keep you stuck. They keep you where you are. Stories are not all good. A lot of stories are defensive and and, uh, they keep you locked in. So a good therapist, I think, is able to work with stories in such a way that the stories are loosened up, the narrative shifts as you go. My own experience of that is that when I'm working with somebody and I hear a narrative that I can tell is causing them suffering, just the way they tell their story, then I, I, I will talk to them about the way I hear the details, what I hear going on. In other words, I bring in my narrative to some extent, not my own personal life, I don't mean that. I mean, I bring in the narrative that I suspect, that I hear, that I gather from what is being told. And usually it's not the same as a narrative being told by the other person. And that's a really good situation because out of that difference in our stories that we hear, we are able to reimagine what's going on. We're able to bring imagination into the picture. And that is really very helpful. Now, um, I've, uh, uh, and these ideas I'm beginning to talk to you about um, are from a, my latest book, which is called Soul Therapy. 
it's really a kind of redundancy because therapy has the word soul in it, but most people don't understand that. So I emphasize soul, soul therapy. And uh, one of the things that, uh, that I taught that I write about in this book in line with what I'm saying right now is that um, the therapist has got to be able to then listen almost like an artist or like a, a writer or a literary person listening to what, what story is being told and hear it as a story. One of the quotes I have in that book, Soul Therapy is from Umberto Eco. He says, every story that is told Every st story that we tell is a story that has been told before. It's like saying every story that we tell about our own lives is also a mythic story. It has, it has big, big dimensions. Of course, this is Jung's approach to narrative and therapy that he developed quite himself in a quite a, an original way. And he used the word amplify. He said that you can amplify a person's story by referring the story, by noticing the greater story that's being told in the simple story of life. So someone tells a story about how angry they are at their father and how they're depressed about that whole relationship. Therapists might think, wow, I'm in the, I'm in the region of Hamlet here. This is a great story that is being told maybe deep within this simple story for the person in front of me. You don't, you don't say, okay, now that's Hamlet. I'm gonna now talk about Hamlet. No, you just use that as background to enlarge, amplify the story that you're hearing. So you might be able to see bigger themes, greater themes in it because of the great, lit the great literary figure of, of uh, Hamlet. Hamlet, by the way, is one of these figures, an interesting figure in life. He's an imaginal figure. That is, he's from literature. He's, uh, he's, he's uh, uh, Shakespeare's discovery. I wouldn't say creation. He's, he's Shakespeare's discovery. And there are other figures like that. For example, Sherlock Holmes is one of my favorites. So when I'm in London, I go to London fairly often when it's not COVID. I go to London and I love to, to be on Baker Street where Sherlock Holmes had his rooms, his, uh, his apartment. And people go there to his, his apartment uh, in great numbers today to look and see the hat that he wore, the pipe he used, the violin he played. And yet he's an imaginal figure. He's an imaginal figure. But it's so interesting. I think that's wonderful, really. That's why um, I wrote a book on Christmas not, like a few years ago. And I make a big deal about Santa Claus being real. He's real as an imaginal figure, just as a Hamlet is and just as Sherlock Holmes is. And I think that if, as we listen to a person's stories and narratives, as we are therapists, we can relate to these relate to figures and find these great figures that are influencing a person's life. But it means you have to be a little, I don't know what the word is, you have to be, you can't be too rational about it all. You have to be able to live in a world that's not so, well, let me put it this way, it's more dreamlike, it's a more dreamlike world. And maybe that's the purpose of working with dreams in therapy is to enter that realm where we become dreamier and we can therefore touch deeper aspects of a person's life and existence. So this uh, leads me to one other step I want to talk to you about. Um, that is a big part of this book that I wrote, Soul Therapy. And that is, I had this thought that, I felt this for a long time, that it's not just psychotherapists, the professionals, 
who can speak meaningfully and deeply to another person. In other words, there's a way in which there's a therapist and this notion like, like a, an imaginal figure, there's a therapist in, in everyone. I think it's true, isn't it, that when people like your, your relatives or friends ask you if you go to lunch with them because you're thinking you're going through a divorce, they'd say, I really need to talk to somebody, would you talk to me? What's going on there is a kind of therapy, not a professional kind, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that everyone's a professional. Uh, no, it's very, very important and, and significant that some people train themselves to be professional therapists. It's a wonderful profession. But I do think everyone in their own way can momentarily at least respond to another person therapeutically. This is so easy to misunderstand. I, when I published the book, I had some psychiatrists complain to me saying that I'm, I'm telling, telling people that anybody can just go ahead and practice therapy if they have training or not. I don't mean that. I mean that there's a way in which in our ordinary daily lives, we are called upon to speak therapeutically to the people around us. It might be your children if you're a parent. I think it'd be a great thing if parents had some training in therapy. I don't mean to be professionals, but just as part of training to be a parent, to know at a certain moment when it's time to be therapeutic rather than something else. If your child is crying and really upset about something that happened, that might be a good time to say, oh, I know what I need to do here. I need to create a vessel. I need to create a space or I can talk to my child and they know it's a special kind of talking will do. It will be especially meaningful. And I'm not going to cure it. I'm not going to pretend that I'm someone who cures people. I'm just going to listen closely to what my child says and maybe let them know that they have been heard and that I am sympathetic with what's going on with them, whatever it is. That could be very therapeutic. Could be that... Um, I, I've, I used to, I've done a lot of work with hospitals and doctors and nurses. And um, I've, I've visited many hospitals and I visit nurses and I ask them, what portion of your work is therapy or psychological? And most nurses tell me 90%, 90% of their work is psychological. They're there to comfort the patient, to be a companion to them in a way maybe that the, the uh, doctor and technician can't be. Although doctors can go a certain way in that direction too, but nurses in particular, they say 90% of their job is being a therapist. Well, why not take that seriously? This is true. There are many jobs like this where we have to talk in a special way and I'm going to get into some of that, the special ways that we talk to people that are therapeutic. Um, I, uh, I've talked to uh, people who, who own businesses and run businesses and managers. And they say to me, I would like to be able to talk to my employees about what they're going through at home. Like if I have an employee who's having trouble with alcohol, I like to be able to talk to him and say, you know, I understand this, you know, let's talk it through a bit. And, uh, but they say, these people, these uh, managers and business owners tell me, I'd like to do that, but I'm not qualified. Now that's a very interesting fantasy. By fantasy, I mean image that we get, a story that we tell. Why is it that we emphasize so strongly that only someone who's qualified can talk to someone? I remember once I was at a hospital and uh, I, was, uh, I was on this floor and there was a nursing station and there are a bunch of uh, people around the station, some nurses and other people. I was standing there. And when someone came along and said quite loudly, said, there's a patient in room such and such, 
that needs someone to talk to. And right away, there was a big discussion of who, which social worker they could find. And they couldn't find a social worker right away. And they didn't know what to do. And they'd say, well, we'll have to schedule it for later. And I was standing, standing there wondering why, why one of them couldn't talk to a patient. They didn't say they needed emergency counseling. They said they wanted someone to talk to. So there is this idea, I think, that we professionalize it to such an extent, this work of therapy, which is understandable to some extent because people, who, who, people do take some pleasure in telling other people what to do and how to live. That's part of what goes on in the name of therapy. And some people can do it without any qualifications at all, without any background or any education. And that could be a real problem. On the other hand, if that goes too far, this natural capacity, I think it's baked into human beings. One, thing's human, one thing human beings do is they talk to each other when they're in trouble. It's just something human beings do. It's, it's something we do. I think that's therapeutic. So I think it would be a good idea for the ordinary person, the parent, the teacher, the doctor, the nurse, the business person, the, um, the hairdresser, the bartender, these jobs we know involve a lot of talking at a deep level. A good idea to, I think for a professional therapist to share some of their knowledge. I was very impressed at the beginning of uh, the COVID pandemic, when I listened to therapists, ordinary therapists in small towns, get on television or speak on the radio or on a podcast and talk about, you know, talk about their profession and help people deal with their issues and maybe help them help others based on what the therapists know from their training and experience. I think that's so important. We have such knowledge and training, those of us who are therapists, it'd be a really good idea to get that out there where people become more sophisticated emotionally and psychologically about their lives. It would be amazing. Imagine if our politicians were, you know, were influenced or shaped by that kind of psychological education. I think we'd be in much better shape because they violate a lot of, a lot of psychological principles quite often. Not always, but you know, quite often. So uh, I'm just going to take a few more minutes to uh, tell you about uh, what you need to know to do therapy, and then we can uh, have some questions. So the first thing that many Jungian uh, therapists learn about is how to create a vessel. The word comes from alchemy. Alchemy was so important to Jung as a whole image system to help appreciate the processes and the elements of the soul. Amazing how, how he was able to use that, use alchemy in that way. So he talked about therapy as a vessel the vase was called the vase, the vessel. Most of the terms in alchemy were Latin terms. And it's nice to use them, you know, broaden yourself, use some Latin terms, it's a good idea. And vase then, the vessel. And uh, the vessel really can mean a lot of different things, but basically it is the container for the therapy. Therapy needs a container. You need a, very simply, you need a place to meet. And deciding what that place will be is significant. It's part of the alchemy of the therapy. So you decide what would be a good place to go to. Now for the therapist, usually the therapist has an office or a consulting room. Uh, and most therapists I know pay a lot of attention to their room 
what kind of chair they have or chairs or what, what kind of images are in the room. I do that myself. One of the things among many things I have in my room is a bronze sculpture of St. Thomas More. He's one of my favorite mythic figures, uh, an historical figure, but also one of great myth. And he, uh, to me, he represents, he gave his life in order to preserve religion in the society and culture, real religion, not just an institution, but a religious feeling, a, a feeling for the infinite and the mysterious. He didn't allow it. He didn't want it to become a political thing. King Henry VIII insisted that everybody make him the ruler, the religious ruler. And Thomas More said, that doesn't make any sense at all. And he was decapitated for that. It was a very, very humane, educated, literate, humorous man, man of great wit. So I have him. Uh, one time I gave a talk in the Netherlands for the Thomas More Society over there, not me, Thomas More of England. And uh, they gave me as a gift this very heavy bronze statue of Thomas More. It's about, I don't know, 18 inches high. And uh, I guess they weren't thinking that I'd have to carry it on a plane for the next two weeks, but it was fine. I carried it around and now it's even more precious to me in my room, in my therapy room. I have many other figures, but he's one of the most important to me because I like the idea of being a holy person in the world. Uh, he's my model for that. So I have Thomas More there just to remind us, remind us, I mean, me and my client. Maybe they don't know who he is. I won't talk about him when they're there, but if they notice him, I'll talk about him. and. Uh, with a great deal of appreciation. And I'm glad that he's there to bless the room, to bring in a certain kind of spirit that I think will be very useful to us. So that's the part of making the vessel. Another part of the vessel is when, when do you meet? What time? How long? That's part of it. Another part of it is how much do you charge? That's part of the vessel, really. It's a very important part for people. A lot of people, when they're just starting out to make an agreement about almost anything, they want to make the vessel by saying, how much does this cost? That gives them a container, a financial container for what's going on. That's something to think about. It's part of the ritual. It's not, it's not just the mechanical, it's not just about money. It's, the money is very significant and the way you talk about the money, it's very significant. Another thing, and I think maybe this is the most important thing, you create the vessel by assuring a person that what they say is confidential, that you are trustworthy, that you are not going to be talking about what is said there to anybody else. When I was a young man, I studied for the Catholic priesthood. I was, in, I was a monk for 13 years. And I think of this as, uh, you know, the, the priest's um, seal of confession, you know, that you don't, you don't say what people have said. I think it's very, very important. And you can't, it's not just that you don't talk about it, but that you find a way to assure the person you're talking to that they can trust you that way. That's part of making the vessel. That can be done not just with the professional therapist, but for the ordinary person. Okay, here's one more thing about, uh, there are other things I'd like to mention later, but one more thing right now, the, 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 especially the Jungian analyst uses dreams as part of the therapeutic work. I've used dreams in my practice for almost, well, I guess 40 years now. And, uh, they have been to me essential. And I've learned from one of my one of my teachers along the way was Rafael Lopez Pedraza. And Rafael uh, said that 
our, the, that the, perp, the role of dreams, the purpose of dream work is to make us dreamier, make us dreamier. It's not to figure out the psyche, that's really a hopeless task. Not to figure out anything, that's a mental egotistical thing to do. Not to figure things out, but to enter the process of the psyche, the soul, meet the soul on its own terms. With the dream, going that deep with uh, imagery that is uh, poetic, artistic, you go into the dream, you invite the dream into your work. Now, what I do with that is I, someone tells me a dream, I often ask for a dream at the beginning of an hour of session. And I don't interpret the dream. It's not my intention to get at the end of that hour to have that dream interpreted. I don't want it interpreted. My, my work is, the way I do it, is to enter that dream. And as we talk about the person's life, the dream keeps inserting itself. The imagery of the dream inserts itself. And so we go along talking dream life, dream life, where they're entwining, to come, they're intermingling all the, all the way through the conversation. So we are getting dreamier as we talk. We are entering that realm of dream but we're not making the dream intelligible to the rational part of us. That can be very satisfying to think you figured out the dream, but that's the illusion of it. And you really have to, I think, you really have to give that up, give up that, sac that sacrifice, that pleasure of thinking you have figured out the dream. Let the dream be part of your conversation. Let it instruct you as you go. Be open to it. Enter the realm of the poetic that gets you closer to the narrative that the person is talking. Instead of seeing that narrative as something to be figured out so that you can come up with a solution to their problem. It's a different method. And I think if you notice carefully Jung's method, you'll find that he works this way. Look at his life, look at memories, dreams, reflections. What does he do? He, he goes to his local stonemasons and learns how to carve stone. Now imagine if someone came to me and said, how can I get better at working with the dreams of my clients? And I said, go and learn how to carve stone. They might think, what in the world is this man talking about? But that's what Jung did. He learned to carve stone, and from then on, he carved alphabets and letters and images. In the Bolligan stone, the stone that he, that he carved on all sides, and in his uh, the tower that he built, and in his home, carving words and images. That, to me, is a pretty good way to work with dreams. Not that you have to go and carve stone, that, that was his way. But you might find a way for yourself where you are opening yourself up to dream language and become familiar with the dream and you can speak faithfully for the dream without having to translate it into non-dream thoughts. Okay, so uh, Erica, I'd like to stop there. Can we have a, some Q&A at this point? Sure, that's fine. Um, does everybody know how to raise your hand? In the, in the bot, there's a place that says, you wanna say, Andy, remind people? Yep, uh, on most uh, setups, if you click on the participants button at the bottom, you'll see the option, I'm sorry. Um, if you click on reactions at the bottom, you'll see raise hand. So would anybody like to a thought with a thought or a question at this point? Valerie, could you please unmute? Um, so 
I know that James Hillman talked about finding the archetypal images in dreams. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about him and your friendship with him. Oh, sure. Sure. That's a great pleasure. I just finished giving uh, three lectures for Pacifica Graduate Institute on Hillman. It was such a pleasure. Um, so I have to, have to you know, squeeze that down to five minutes. Um, so uh, Hillman and I were, were very close friends in Dallas uh, when we both lived there. We were part of a, of a group there called the Dallas Institute of Humanities and Culture. And uh, we gave workshops as part of that. And then every Wednesday night, there was a free lecture. Every Wednesday night, there was a free lecture. And uh, Hillman and others, sometimes people traveling through town who were really remarkable, like Rafael Pedraza and others would, would give their talks. And I gave talks at these Wednesdays. They were filled with people and people were sitting in the windows, open windows and sitting on the stairways. And it was a very lively experience. And um, uh, Hillman and I uh, spent a lot of time together. He didn't drive, so I drove him around a lot to, to various things that we did and to have dinner. We both liked Mexican food, so that was good. We like to go shopping at Neiman Marcus when the sales were on. Um, that was a learning in itself. I'll tell you about that. We were in Neiman Marcus and we were walking in the door and, and uh, Jim said to me, he said, uh, he said, all right, we're going in to buy some clothes. And he said, I, I want, I, what I want is for us to let the clothes choose us. Don't decide what clothes, what shirt you want. That's irrelevant. We're going to find out uh, the shirt maybe that wants us. We're going to let the shirt decide. <laughs> so there's a way, and you know that later became his uh, his work on anima mundi, which is the fact that the world has a soul and that the things of the world have a presence, an identity. Maybe even uh, they suffer, and they uh, they complain. And we could have a relationship to a living world rather than to an inanimate world, a soulful world. So that was that was uh, the kind of I, the way I learned his thinking was going to stores and going out to dinner. There was a lot of that, and uh, I did I did pick up a great deal from him on there. And you know, he wrote a book on dreams in which he says that. What we really ought to do is not bring the dream up into the light of consciousness. We should go bring our consciousness down into the dream world, be affected by the dream. So that, that general orientation, that was one of the things he did. Um, another thing that uh, Hillman did in his thinking that I could just mention maybe in general is that he was he saved he saved experiences is the way I would put it. There are a lot of things that we judge badly that he would judge okay. So I remember one example. There was a man we knew who, uh, who used to dress up in uh, very elaborate gowns. These days, of course, it's just part of life. But then it, this was quite a few years ago and quite, quite remarkable. So we'd see this man we knew walking down the street dressed in a big white gown and maybe flowers on it, pinned on it. This was a very uh, well-respected man and he was kind of risking his reputation. As I say, it was a different world. But Hillman said that this dress was this man's connection to his anima. And if he lost, if he stopped dressing that way, he would lose contact with his anima. And not only was, was that about saving the, the experience, but also behind that was the idea that our symptoms, our pathologies are precious to us. And they are not to be got rid of, but they are to be deepened and realized at such a deep level that they serve the psyche, the soul. Uh, and the, uh, they are transformed more by our uh, appreciating them 
than are trying to uh, eliminate them. Okay, Joe, would you like to unmute? Hello, Tom, Joe Kulin here. Hi, oh, hi, nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you too. <laughs> Uh, Tom, I'm really interested in trying to understand more what you uh, think of as the nature of the soul, because the word can be used in so many ways by so many different disciplines. And uh, I'm wondering if you think soul actually has any kind of materiality. Uh, if so, where is its locality? And if it's not any kind of material thing, is it a projection of our mind? Or is it something that infuses our body? I'm thinking somebody has soulful eyes. What does that mean if somebody has soulful eyes? Where does the soul reside in that kind of case? That's such an interesting question, Joe. Just really terrific. Um, and it's not easy to answer. Uh, I would say that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling and thinking more as I get older that... Uh, that the soul is a thing. Hmm. I'm not saying, I don't know if it's physical. I think we do find it physically. And I don't think it's just poetic language to say someone has soulful eyes or a soulful demeanor or anything like that. It's something that actually describes something that is perceived by people. They perceive it in you. Hmm. It's not just an illusion. And it's certainly not a projection. Uh, I would suggest, and I know it's not a good thing to say in a, in a Jung, Jungian setting, but I would suggest getting rid of the idea of projection altogether. I think what it does, it gives a priority to the ego, that everything that we encounter then is a projection of the ego. I don't think that's the way it is. We do encounter soul in the world. And so I, I, I'd rather look at it that way, closer to the way you're describing it. Um, I, d I once saw uh, early in the early days, I remember seeing uh, one of these uh, uh, newspapers, what do you call them, uh, kind of a you know, cheap newspaper on the stand that showed a photograph that someone had taken a photograph of a soul. Of course, that was interesting to me to find out what kind of a photograph they had. And they had this person on, a, on an operating table and they were operating on him and this light was coming up. I mean, the light that was coming out was obviously drawn by somebody. It was very easy to see. But I thought it was interesting still that people are trying to find the physicality of the soul. Mm -hmm. Aristotle was interesting. You know, Aristotle is interesting. I, I was just reading Aristotle the other day, <laughs> if I can say that. And uh, I was reading his De Anima, or they called De Anima, he was Latin for him, I don't know why, uh, on the soul. And he was saying that every part of the body has soul. Every hmm. individual particular part of the body has soul. Hmm. Interesting. So, yeah, it's not just, and this is Aristotle who's, you know, Plato is kind of flaky, but Aristotle is not. Right. So uh, he's saying that uh, every part of the body in its particulars has soul. That's a very interesting thing to try to bring into our own way of thinking, you know, our own uh, contemporary way of talking and thinking. And uh, I think one way I see that is uh, when I do go to hospitals and I see that people have different specialties, I'm very interested in the, how they might see the soul in their specialty. Like let's say they're, someone is a kidney specialist. I wonder if they've ever really thought or ever taught about the soul of a kidney and oh. you know, what that could be. And, and understand that in relationship to the problem that appears with the kidney and to the person who is suffering the problem. That's what I've done for years in hospitals. I try to bring in the imagination and so that we don't make the, uh, all of our talk about medicine only physical, because that's soulless and that's not human. It's not human if you don't include the soul. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, thank you for that. Sebastian. Thank you, Erica. Uh, thanks, Dr. Thomas Moore. Um, it's such a great pleasure to listen to you in person. I'm a big fan of you. 
do, during you. my graduate work. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Thank one of the questions I have, I know that you were in academia for a long time and then you left it. Um, I'm in the world of academia. One of the, um, one of the crisis, I'm in academia for a while, for a long time now. One of the crisis point that I have been experiencing is that uh, academia, especially mental health, I'm in the marriage and family therapy program. Oh yeah. Um, the social pro- so anyway, there's a lot of focus on theories, um, measurable goals, you know, all the, the, the language that we talk about yes, these right. days. At the same time, there's the important part, which is uh, soul, the, the, the work that you talked about, uh, care of the soul and all these things. That is somehow missing. It's completely absent. And we are creating a new generation of therapists, so-called therapists, focus on evidence-based practice. I'm not, not, I'm not against evidence-based practice. Again, the soul focuses on evidence-based practices and measurable goals and theoretical orientations. And how, what, what do you say to a person like me who is seeing the importance of, I was in the priesthood for a while and then I left the priesthood. So again, um, so how do you, how do you, um, what do you say to people like me who are struggling with this in the new academic world, which doesn't care for any of these creating the vessel, soul work, and none of those kind of things. That's my question. Very complicated, convoluted question. <laughs> no, no, it's very, it's very familiar. I, I know I've struggled with that for roughly 45 years, I think. Yeah, I think I know. So uh, one thing occurs to me is that we can reimagine through our, our, we do have theories or we do have literature on the soul. I'm going back to Plato and Aristotle tonight. There are many, many other figures that we can go back to to get uh, to get wonderful ideas about soul. Um, it's not it's not something we're making up, you know. It's this is a ancient tradition, a long, long one. It's the, you don't have to apologize for it. And um, one thing Hillman did that I found useful to your point is that uh, in his essays on alchemy. It's in his uh, uniform edition on alchemy. I don't know where exactly otherwise to find it, but he has a, a section on goals, on the alchemical goal. And he writes about goals. And what he's doing there, which what he always does, is reimagines uh, the very nature of what a goal is. And he quotes Jung. He bases, as he very, very often does, he bases his revisioning of goals on Jung. And Jung's statement about that was that goals are ideas. Goals are ideas. They're not to be taken literally. They're not to be taken literally. Say, this is my goal. I must get to it. No. Hillman makes the point when he explores this in a very interesting way that the goal leads us on. It's an image that takes us deeper into whatever it is we're doing. We don't need to literalize it in the sense that I must accomplish this or I have failed. That is such a reduction of the, what a goal could be. So we could look, we could look instead, we could revision, reimagine, redefine what a, re, you know, all of that re stuff, what a, what a goal is. And you could do it in your practice. Now I understand that uh, people around you will not be doing that for the most part. Uh, so there I am, I'm, I'm reminded of a lecture by another uh, friend who was very, very brilliant. Uh, Ivan Illich was part of our group at, there in Dallas at, for a while. And Illich one night gave a talk, his Wednesday night talk was called Successful Avoidance. Successful Avoidance. And he was just giving a sort of talk on Hermes, you might say, a talk uh, to say that those of us, like in situations you're describing, have got to learn how to successfully avoid being caught in those traps. Be, successfully avoid having to go jump through the hoops uh, that other people in their misguided philosophies want us to do. So what do you do? You don't fight it because you're going to lose. Uh, when I first started teaching at Southern Methodist University, Hillman said to me, you're going, they're going to fire you. 
said, they're not going to allow you to talk about soul at the university. They're going to fire you. Are you ready for that? I said, yeah, I'll see how much time I can put in. And after seven years, they fired me, just as he said they would. It was the best thing ever happened to me because that particular, that's another way. Being being fired can be a, a real gift, you know. I mean, it can really give you something important in your life. So that's what I'm saying about Hillman's work. To look at what normally we judge badly, but turn it around and see that from another angle, it is not so bad. And what you're doing like now, you're in a position... You're in a position where the people around you are doing things they don't agree with. But imagine if you were in a position where everyone was agreeing with you. That might even be worse. I've seen that. Everyone agrees. Everyone has the same philosophy, and it's a disaster. Because they're all fighting each other, which one's going to be the, the king of this thing. And, and there's no real conversation going on. It's all repeating the same things all the time. So if you can... Uh, what's the word, uh, successfully avoid the problem and repicture, reframe what you're doing in a way that you can be successful. And don't, don't fight those people. It's not, it's not the way. You may be tempted to. But that temptation is very similar to the temptation wanting to figure out a dream. It gives you a momentary thrill, but it's not really going to take you where you need to go. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Good luck. Mini. Um, oh, this is so yummy and beautiful. Thank you. I, I feel myself wanting to ask you in service to soul, what does soul want from us to serve it? What What is soul if we are going to you know, let the shirt choose us, then souls, and we want to serve soul. What what serves soul? Do you understand what I'm asking? Yes, I think so. I think so. It's not easy. It's not easy. None of these questions are easy. Uh, but I think that part of it might be that uh, you discover this tremendous uh, fundamental truth, if, that's, if I can use that word. Uh, that uh, the whole thing aims at, at uh, letting your life be guided okay. rather than you be in charge. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Uh, I told you about my friend Chris who died this morning. Mm -hmm. I went to see him last week and there was a, a bunch of us were there and we there was a lot of small talk and it was great, you know, to mm -hmm. see him. It's been a while. But I pulled him aside and right away I went right down to the quick of it. You know, I wanted to enter, for me, enter therapeutic mode, not in a professional sense or any kind of phony sense, but really to invoke this deep, deep connection of therapy. Mm -hmm. I said to him, how are you handling this cancer and, and you're approaching death? And he looked at me like I had asked a stupid question or something or that, a question that didn't have any relevance to him, right away, automatically. And as soon as he did that, I knew, here is this man who lived his whole life preparing for this time, for this moment. Uh -huh. he, he, was, he was ready. Mm -hmm. He said, he said I, I do what is asked, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's really where we're headed. Mm -hmm. What does the soul want? It wants us to follow mm -hmm. rather than lead. Mm -hmm. It wants us to follow and be guided. Now, that could be guided by dreams, guided by another person. It could be guided by a muse. I take mm -hmm. muse very seriously. Me too. Guided by a muse, mm -hmm. guided by a, 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 a daimon, you know, a kind of a daimonic presence that moves you in your life. And in spite of all the reasons on all sides, you follow the daimon. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. That's why with Hillman, let the shirt choose you. Thank you. I'm, I'm thinking of the idea of the U diamond, the EU diamond, the yeah. guide yeah. to our 
our depth, our joyful fulfillment, our eudaimonia, where it all fills up the whole thing. Thank you. That sense of guide and serve is a, it's this, right? It's, it's this. Yeah. Rather than this. That's right. It's an opening. I, I, I have to dance instead of carve stone uh, to understand. That's great. Thank you. Sure. Deborah. Um, I'm really grateful for all the preceding questions and and maybe it's moot. Maybe you've answered it and I haven't quite processed it yet, but um, there was a period in my life when I had the freedom to follow you and Hillman around a bit, you know, like to just go wherever you were both talking. And it saturated me, you know, it was a blue dye. It was a blue fire. And so I'm, there are certain ideas that never leave me. And one is the idea of the soul of the polis. And I have this fantasy about Dallas that you had collected a community of people who believed in that possibility, you know, the therapy. And I'm near Washington, DC. And over the last several years, it's been hard not to have a fantasy about what would it look like, you know, to have a cadre of those who believed. And maybe it's just because I'm an extroverted intuitive, you know, or you notice all the television programs and all the grist there is, you know, of, of meaty things that are um, predicting what's about to happen or speaking to what's about to happen or all these things we could be processing together and applying Jung's and Hillman's thinking to. And when you speak it, I speak it. Um, people don't think it's precious enough. You know, that Jung was more, um, what is the word? Selective about those to whom his work applied. Or I don't have the language for what I'm trying to say, except that there's a class issue there. And, uh, um, and a sense of Hillman having offended so many people so deeply that they don't want to hear a thing he had to say. Do you know what I'm trying to say here? And I feel like his idea about this is so damn precious and the time is so um, aching for us to bring soul to, you know, like it's here and how to bring attention to itself and, and honoring. And yeah, when you talk about soul in people, I think about the difference between Baltimore and Washington and how differently the soul lives in those two communities, you know, and is honored or not. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I got something out anyway. I think, no, one, one of the points, there's several points you're making there, but one of them is, I think, very important that uh, it has to do with uh, being in a uh, elite or select society. And um, what is the measure of that eliteness? Now, to me, when I'm talking about Dallas, you probably can detect that my experience there with him, not the city of Dallas, but with him at that place, was uh, a tremendous worth to me and really affected my life. Now, is that, that's not really an elitism. There was nothing elite about it, far from it. Uh, we were ostracized. I was kicked out of SMU and he was kicked out of a lot of things, even there. And, uh, for one thing, he decided people offered him this very glorious suburban home. And uh, he decided to buy this, this old wooden house in a black neighborhood and down in the center of Dallas. That's where he wanted to live. And um, so it's not about elitism, but it is about, I think the elitism is moving toward wanting to have a group of friends a group of people that you can count on that will support you no matter what. And that's not, do you see what I'm saying? The elite, the elite group is a symptomatic group. Exactly. <laughs> a group of friends is what we're looking for. This is the philosophy of Epicurus in Greece called, we use our, we have our word Epicurean, but we don't use it the way he did. It meant living with your friends pleasurably. 
That was his philosophy, essentially. Living with your friends pleasurably. So I would say if you if we are if you see elitism going on, understand that is you don't don't judge it. That's not going to do any good. Don't judge those people uh, or us people, whoever we all sometimes find our elites. But rather um, appreciate the fact that this is a symptom looking for deepening, and the deepening of that elitism would be to discover friends who can really support you and make you feel secure and, uh, and joyful in your life. So if you can do that, um, you have preserved your symptom, your pathology. You've taken it to a place where it can be fruitful. And that's the essence of this, this approach. Mary? Um, can you hear me? Yes, Mary, is that you? Yeah, yeah that's me. Oh, I have a question. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I work with people with addiction, and I'm wondering what you would think or say was happening to the, uh, the soul in addiction. Yeah, uh, well, I think it's very similar to what I was just saying, that uh, we, we want to see addiction as a, as a kind of a symptom I don't know if that's the best word, but it's one that I tend to use. Oh, pathology, pathology is a little strong for me, but uh, like I said, it's a symptom of something. And for example, uh, uh, let me give you a, a little story that I often tell. Um, I had a client in my early years of being a therapist who was having a woman having trouble with alcohol, uh, alcoholic and not being able to get away from it. And she presented a dream in which an angel appeared in a church and placed on the altar a very nice looking martini. <laughs> and I thought this was one of the most remarkable and instructive dreams I had ever heard. Even ever since, I'm still telling about it because I thought it was so useful. Because what it's, especially if you know alchemy, what what is happening there is that this woman, it's showing that this woman has been stuck on symptomatic alcohol. And this substance, you know, that you take into your body that is entirely physical and has these physical reactions. But the dream is giving her a spiritual or alchemical uh, alcohol, which is very different. It's not literal. And if she could find that, that, al that alcohol, the alchemists refer to it like they, they call, they distinguish between H2O water and aqua permanence, eternal water. The eternal water is not a fluid that you drink, it's fluidity itself. It's uh, something that will end your deep thirst in life. You know, it's, it's not physical, it's something else. And uh, I think that, that that would be a guide for us in dealing with addictions of all kinds. If we could see, as someone often said, look for the God in the symptom. What myth is being told? What, what divine figure is there to give us a, a insight into what is really happening? So in this case of the, uh, of the woman in the martini, I think that was our guide from then on. Let's not speak against alcohol. The alcohol that is driving her crazy has led us to the revelation of the alchemical alcohol, which is exactly what she needs for her very essence. Oh, so it's a great benefit to have had the symptom and then to have found the, uh, you know, the, the deep uh, mythic co uh, co correlative to that symptom. I think we can do that with all addictions. <laughs> Thanks. Thomas, it's, uh, do you want to take a break or continue with questions right now? Or what would you You know, to it's, it's, uh, I would like you to decide that for me because I have no idea. Well, uh, I have no idea. <laughs> if you think a break would be useful for people, it's absolutely fine for me. But lately, I've been finding that a short break is, you know, is fine, but nothing too long.
because we only got two hours together. Yeah, it's totally up to you. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think we had to take, a, a, let's say, a four and a half minute break. And Francis will be the next person when we have. Francis questions. will be coming up next. Yeah. Uh, after, after the break. Yeah, that's fine. Great. All right. Thank you. So five minutes, right? Five minutes. Okay. Are you ready to go on, Thomas? I am ready to go. Would you like to take Francis's question before? Please. You? That'd be great. Sure. Um, Francis needs a. You're muted, Francis. Yeah. I'm. Can I? Am I unmuted now? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, I'm really addressing the the earlier topic of uh, the soul of the the young man who's a professor in family therapy and your response to him was to ignore some of those rules and just do the work sort of, I'm interpreting that. But I was the clinical director for 22 years. And during the nineties, um, insurance companies required this, that goals, you know, accountability. And my clinicians were very upset. And I used Hegel's um, master slave uh, thing, which is the master isn't free, uh, but the slave is. The slave is free because he has his work. And I told my clinicians, do what is required to do your goals and all that, the insurance. But when you go behind your door, you're a free person, you're doing your work. And that was my soulful contribution to the 90s <laughs> in terms of clinicians in my clinic. Yeah. I think that's... that's yeah. That's very, very, I think, very good advice. I'm glad you you mentioned that. Uh, in a in another way of looking at it, I, I, I alluded to it briefly. Uh, one of the things I like to teach is the whole mythology of Hermes. In the Greek uh, mythology, Hermes is a figure who is not always sincere. He in in the story he of his birth, he steals his brother's cattle on the first day of his birth. And then he lies about it when he's asked about it. And he said he's, he deceives, but that's not meant literally. It's not meant, uh, it's not saying you should lie and deceive. That's not what it is. That would be literal. The question is though, is how to be more Hermes-like where you are not a slave to the truth and a slave to facts and to have to say everything you know, that's demanded of you. And to be able, so really I was not saying not to pay attention to the rules. That's really not, was not my point, but it was more about being her, more her, Hermes-like. That is find ways to be, you know, like you said, to be able to follow the rules where you can and where you don't have to, uh, obviously, do what you feel is proper and appropriate, not just what you want, because that's not the point, but do what you think is the best thing to do. And I think we are always doing that. Whenever whenever I've taught therapists over the years, and we, we often have a date about Hermes, that's the one they like best, because it, because they see the value of not having to be in a straitjacket of a factual truth and following the rules in every instance. And you have to ask yourself about following. I didn't get that. Could you try again? I don't know what that is. Uh, and uh, so when you, um, oh, now I lost my thought. Uh, when you when you are uh, not following the rules, uh, what you are doing is you are um, you're not trying to break rules. That's that's the point. That's not your objective to break rules. That's something else. That would be probably too much ego in there too. But the the idea is more that you're trying to accomplish something that is valuable and necessary, and you you do, you try to allow yourself as much freedom as you can get. I think that's probably a better way to put it. But I like very I like what you said very much. Thank you. I think we've had all the questions for now. One can't know everything, can one? 
Um, wow. What is, what is the book? <laughs> I, Mary has her hand up, but I think she's already. Thomas, would you like to say, go more into talking a little bit, or would you like to continue asking questions? You know, I think it would be a good idea to go back just for a little bit of a, of a, a little bit, a few more ideas from me, and then more questions after that. How would that be? Sure. Okay, good. It's not a good idea, probably dynamically, just to be doing the same form all the time. So uh, I'd like to say a few more things about what goes on in therapy. And one of those things is uh, one that, uh, that Jung wrote about uh, extensively. And that is the, what, he, what he referred to and others do as the transference. It's a very interesting idea to me especially if you don't follow just the classical approach to it. Uh, classically, transference often means that a client in therapy transfers the experiences and memories of uh, parents and childhood onto the therapist and then works them out with the therapist. But Jung, Jung's idea about, uh, about these transferences was that um, they are not literal trans, there's not literally transferring experiences from one person to another. He says, and it's pretty interesting, I don't, I can't give you his exact words now, but they're like this, that, that uh, certain archetypal images were present in your childhood, and then you find them present in other relationships. That's different. Can you see the difference between those two things? On the one hand, you talk about how you've had an experience in childhood and that gets transferred to this new person. So this new person becomes like the father you had dif difficulty with, something like that. Jung says something different. He's saying that the, in childhood, what happens is that certain archetypal mythic patterns uh, narrative, pieces of narrative, get experienced then, and they get experienced later, too, with other people, perhaps colored by the experience of childhood. But basically, it's the archetypal fantasy that is, you see it in one place, then you see it in another. So let's say you might experience what a father figure is in childhood in a certain way. Certainly you understand father to some extent. And then you have to deal with father. Perhaps you, you end up with a, encountering a father figure in your therapist and you've got to, you have to deal with him or her. It could be a her too. So you, you find it there, you find it in both places and that's the transference. The other part of it that makes it more complex seems to me is that we are full of fantasies about people, about our past, about how the world works, how people are. We're full of those fantasies. And when you meet somebody, especially for the first time, something about that person might be very slight, just a physical characteristic or some of the way they talk, something sort of uh, excites this, this pattern, this pattern that you that it's part of your repertoire of fantasies. And it gets excited again with the therapist or with another person, it could be anybody. I would think that the transference is going on always everywhere. So right now I would think you are having transference experiences with me as I am with you. It's just something about some of the things I've said, some one little thing I said, uh, or my, the background to where I am here, uh, the slightest thing might tick off one of these archetypal fantasies, one of these fantasies that come settle on you now and then, and you encounter it once again tonight. And then you might again tomorrow somewhere. But what happens in the therapeutic, very intense, uh, situation of therapy, because it is so intense and you're looking at so closely at it, what happens is that um, these fantasies can get in the way 
where they can color the relationship. And they are largely unconscious. That would be Jung's idea, largely unconscious, that we don't, we don't know this is happening, but it is happening and it does affect our relationship. And so part of therapy is to be able to see and catch and notice some of the fantasies that are going on in the transferences of your life. But in therapy, especially the therapist might be interested in the fantasies that are uh, interfering with the relationship with him or her. So that becomes a really interesting part of, uh, of the whole process of talking intimately and deeply to another person. You're inviting more and more of these really important uh, narratives and fragments of narrative to enter the picture and, and cloud the whole thing, make it more difficult. And part of your job then is to sort all this out. And as you sort it out, you begin to find out what your myths are, what your stories are, and the figures that are part of your life, you might discover them because the therapist can bring them to your attention. First of all, spot them and then bring them to your attention. That is something that the therapist can really offer that is of great value. And not everybody's capable of doing that. Some people who are not therapists might have the gift. A lot of people have a gift of being a therapist. And even though they're not therapists. Um, but the point is that uh, uh, that you can, maybe you can notice what those things are. I'm using this word notice carefully, again, going back to Hillman and revisioning psychology. He has this little part that is always interested in me, uh, interested me. And that is where he talks about the Renaissance idea of notizia. Notizia, that would be a Latin, I mean, an Italian word, notizia. Notice. And when you put it that way, keep it in the Italian, it's like saying, noticing is a, is a key thing to do as a therapist. You notice. You notice things that most people would not notice. A very important skill of a therapist to notice. I notice what's happening. I notice, I notice what your leg does when you talk about this subject. Noticing something that most people would just uh, let pass by. So I think that's, uh, that's another thing, another issue. It has to do with the transferences, but also with the skill of noticing as you go. Now, one of the things that I, I've already talked about, but I wanna mention it more explicitly because I think it is so important. And that is Hillman's idea of going with the symptom, not just him, but many people around him. We're talking, in the early days about go, go with the symptom, go into the symptom. Don't move against the symptom. Don't try to get rid of the symptom. It's not easy sometimes. Someone tells you that, oh, they're really, they're so lonely, they can't stand it. They don't know, they might even have suicide fantasies of being so lonely. And whatever they do, they can't, they can't deal with their loneliness. And you might, immediately think of ways in which they can get over their loneliness. Well, be around more people, make friends, go where people are, uh, all that kind of thing. It's, that goes against the symptom. You're trying to say, okay, you're lonely, I'm gonna tell you how not to be lonely. The, 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 in archetypal psychology, the, the dictum is go with the symptom or go into it. If a person's lonely, you try to go into the loneliness and find out what that feels like. Get more stories about the loneliness. Make it more particular. Give it all of its details. Um, and as you do that, you don't speak against the symptom. You never say, I can help you get rid of that. Or why don't you finally get rid of this loneliness by being around people? That's just someone, that, you know, a lot of therapists do this. They, they come up with a solution, you know, <laughs> like out of nowhere, they come up with a solution for somebody else. They haven't even talked to them very much and they have a solution. Oh, you've said lonely, my solution is be around people. It's, it's too obvious and it's too simple-minded. 
if you go into the symptom, what would happen then would be perhaps a person could discover how to be alone. Maybe for the first time in their life, discover that it's not a horror to be alone. That being it to be able to incorporate in your life some time when you're by yourself, that might be a good thing. Learn to live with a certain kind of loneliness. See what happens with what happens with uh, the symptom this way is that once you have you have spoken for it, um, it the, the language shifts. That's what I see. The language shifts. So instead of now talking about loneliness, we're talking about being alone. Once you go deeper into the symptom, the language moves just a little bit. It preserves the symptom in a sense. It keeps the alone part, but it gets rid of the painful part. Oh, I'm lonely. Instead, you're saying, you know, it doesn't feel so bad to have a little time to myself. That's all it takes. And that can, therefore, it can be a way ultimately of relieving the suffering, but it's not getting rid of the symptom. It's deepening the symptom, transforming it, allowing it to reveal something that is contained almost like a, a nut and a you know, kernel in a nut, something like that inside that we don't normally see. We discover it and this becomes something positive and valuable. This could be applied to everything you can imagine. We go with the symptom. I've been doing this for all these years. And this is in the back of my mind always when I'm dealing with the client. I'm going to go, I'm not going to speak against the symptom. I'm not going to have it in my mind anywhere that I want to get rid of the symptom. But I'll keep talking and working this thing until we kind of go through it. Uh, Hillman quotes uh, Wallace Stevens uh, about uh, the way the way through the world is more important than the way around it. I don't think important is Stevens's word, but it's something like that. Um, the way through is more important than the way around. You go through the symptom and you find yourself at the other end of it. You still have it, but it's no longer this cause of suffering. So I think that's a very important, very valuable uh, rule of thumb uh, for the therapist too, to go with the symptom. One more thing I'll mention before we uh, ask questions again. Um, when we talk about archetypes, and Jung discussed this extensively. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm talking about opposites now, that archetypes tend to have polar opposites or polar tandems. Hillman preferred the word tandem for that rather than opposite, but Jung uses opposite a lot. And we have it in his book, Mysterium Conjunctionis. He lists at the beginning, he lists like 50 different oppositions that he wants to explore in writing this book. Uh, that's If you're going to pick a book to read of Jung's in this collective works, I'd suggest Mysterium Conjunctionis. Uh, so, so much wisdom and usefulness there. So the way I experience it is, and it relates to something that I've worked on quite a lot, is um, people sometimes would say to me, say that they feel they are too dependent. They are codependent. They are too dependent on other people. Help me deal with this uh, tendency to be too dependent. Now, what am I going to do? Am I going to immediately, without thinking, start talking how, how they can be independent? That's not going with the symptom, that's going the opposite place. What I will do is try to see if they're, to explore the possibilities and maybe the fears about uh, depending on people, uh, being vulnerable, uh, connecting to people in a way that they don't have to lead all the time. That would be going with the symptom. And in, be, in discovering then how to be more how to be dependent in a way that is not painful or disastrous. To learn how to do that. That sets up the right condition for then, if you want to be independent, what you really have to deal with first, because this is your problem, 
deal with the dependency first and get that right. I mean, get it, get it more, get deep in that thing. And then you're able to make the connection with the opposite. It's a, it's a tricky thing because it seems counterintuitive. You know, when someone tells you something and then you go right into their biggest problem and say, that's a good problem to have. You don't really say that, but I mean, you, you, don't, you don't work against the symptom, you go with it. And uh, I've seen this, especially in uh, issues of power and uh, vulnerability. And uh, I wrote a book a number of years ago called Dark Eros, which is about the, based on the work of the Marquis de Sade, where uh, I explore this idea of sadomasochism. I think sadomasochism, at least as a general dynamic, is in our lives daily. You meet somebody, and somehow or other, just in the way you you interact, that person gets the power. Or just the opposite, you get the power and they don't want it. Uh, you end up with this very slight, mild, you know, very small kind of sadomasochism, but it's there in everything and that can get big and really cause problems ultimately of violence. But that's, that's another example of this opposition that you have to be aware. I think as therapists be aware of the opposite of what you're being told. Someone tells you, I'm just too dependent on everybody. If you buy into that, you're not going to have much luck probably. What you have to do is realize that the opposite piece of that is also present. This person being so dependent probably has an awful lot of rage and control, need to control that is just in the background, demanding some kind of participation. So we have to be, I think, Clever, we have to be thoughtful about people and not just be gullible, you can't be gullible. You can't take what's given to you. You have to really look and see what's going on. You can do that compassionately, not judging, but with compassion, because we all do it. We're all sadomasochistic. Okay, I think that's enough. Um, if you have any questions, this would be a good time to finish up. Allison. Thank you. Thank you. I'm enjoying this so much. Um, Thank you, Allison. Absolutely. Um, so my question, uh, I was trying to formulate it. Um, so I'm not sure it's a direct question, but I'm curious about um, maybe your personal evolution of your soul um, and um, how that relates to the evolution of your work as a therapist and as a writer um, and an inspirer. Um, because uh, where I am now, decades into my practice as a psychotherapist, I've noticed the evolution, but I'm at a new stage where, um, you know, personal soul work is very, deeply important to me and I'm I'm curious about how you witnessed that process in your own work and in your own life. Another another excellent question. Uh, well I can tell you a little bit. Uh, one thing that occurs to me is that when I started out I was in terrible shape. <laughs> I was just an emotional wreck and for lots of reasons. I had not long before uh, had you know been been in this monastery for 13 years. That'll wreck you, you know. I mean, it's beautiful, and I have a lot of good things from it, but it's also psychologically, it's not the best environment. And um, so, I really, I really often felt, often felt that my clients were in much better shape than I was, and. I, I, had, I had thought about that and I had read about that phenomenon of, you know, of being that way. And so uh, ideas help me a lot as a therapist. I'm kind of an idea person, you know, that's just who I am. I have books around me. I don't, I don't dance very well. Uh, it's a, putting it mildly. And uh, so 
uh, I felt that I had confidence, but I was really a wreck. And I now look back, I was just thinking about it just the other day, that I think that being in that state when I started out helped me a great deal. Because I didn't feel like I was on top of anything or was better than anybody. I, just the opposite. Uh, I would have given anything to have some of the problems my clients had rather than mine. So I could, but working through those things of my own. And the therapy helped me actually, really did help me because I had to be, I knew I had to be a, a pretty, pretty strong and, you know, able person to deal with. I had really tough clients when I started out, really tough. A lot of really psychotic people that I worked with. And I loved it. And I think, I think I was quite successful with it. But I think it was because I was not exactly together myself. And I learned a lot in the process. I learned so much in those early few years. I learned so much that I would say that after five years, I was in an entirely different place. And from that time on, I really had a lot of uh, confidence in my work as a therapist. And uh, and uh, I don't know, I think every year I feel a, a more confidence. So it, it builds. And I don't think you could ask too much of yourself in the earlier years. Yeah, it takes a lot to learn this. You can't learn it from a book or from a class or from a you know, workshop. Okay, Joe. Joe? Maybe he's away from his thing. Um, Hear me? Oh, there you go, Joe. Oh, oh yeah. Um, so, Tom, thanks for your insights and wisdom. It's really very special to hear your presentation. But I was curious about, about the way you work with uh, your clients with uh, in dreams, uh, sort of the intertwining of them. Uh, I know one of our favorite authors, yours and mine, uh, is Helen Luke, um, again, uh, someone who studied with Jung. Uh, and her work very much was exploring dreams to, to a deep extent, and also in creative imagination. I'm wondering, do you use creative imagination in any extent in your work? Uh, no, I don't, Joe. Um, I don't use... Uh... That or active imagination, I don't use that. Active um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't do that. Um, mainly because it seems too much, for me, it feels too much like a technique. I feel that, that, that my relationship to the person I'm working with has got to be intense and very real between us. And therefore, I don't, I, I don't favor too much, although I don't, I don't, I'm not speaking against those methods because some people do them very well, I think. I think for myself, I, I'm, more, I'm more effective as a therapist by establishing a really strong relationship with the person. It's really hard to say is that relationship. It means that the therapeutic relationship, that we can be present with the purpose of, of uh, dealing with the psyche or the soul of the person there, really do that, take that very seriously. It's not so much about interpersonal relationship, but the relationship to that person's deep life. And I love doing that. And I'm very willing and able to be connected at a deep level that way. And I use my intuition in doing that. But for me to use any kind of method of getting the dream characters to speak or do anything like that would be, it would break the, break the, uh, the tension of the creative tension of the moment. So I don't do it. That's one reason I think I, I feel in some way I'm making an excuse there, but because my real reason is more of that uh, I don't want to control images. I, I think I should be affected by images and not affect them. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. Sebastian. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Uh, again, what a great pleasure to listen to you uh, this evening. 
Um, most of your work, from my understanding, that you, I mean, for me, you are one of the um, most leading psychotherapists in my world, at least, um, who emphasize the importance of soul, the soul's work, care for the soul, and all those things you talked about. Could you say a little more about, or could you say something about how soul guided you? Or you also talk about guidance of the soul receiving, you know, that let soul guide you, that kind of, you emphasized too much, uh, you emphasized it this evening as well. So could you say something about how your soul guides you? What is your relationship with your soul? Thank you. I think to, to do that uh, accurately, you have to say how soul guides you and not your soul. Uh, this, this, it's not so much your, you know, it's right. Okay. That's right. Yeah, thank you. So yeah. in that regard, uh, if you can see soul as other to some extent, and also as different faces, uh, when I talk about muse, I think that's a sort of a face or an avatar or angel of a soul. You know, it's like some, uh, some figure who actually does a particular work of the soul. So when the soul guides me, it might mean that I am paying attention, and I have to do this all the time, pay attention to the muse who guides me in writing. Uh, right now, I'm trying to begin a book, and I've written 100 pages of it, maybe four or five times already. It's given me a hard time to know just the voice and what I really want to get at and the angle and everything. And it's the only, the only way that's going to be resolved is through a muse, not through me. I can't do it through my mind or my skills or my you know, whatever I think I know, my past experience, I have to have a muse to it. And that would be the soul guiding me. And that, that's one way. Another way is that other people take, uh, other people represent the soul to me. I think that's a very common thing. So when I was teaching at the Southern Methodist University and the, the chair of the department called me in to tell me that uh, they didn't, they weren't going to give me tenure. And I thought they would, I just assumed they would. I, I liked teaching and I, I thought everything was fine. Obviously it wasn't in their mind. And uh, they didn't tell me, you know, there's a private meeting. I didn't know what it was all about. So the chair of the department said to me, he said, no, if you want to, uh, if you want to appeal this, you can do that. There's a process for appealing this decision. And I said, no, I, I've heard the angels speak. I didn't say that, but I said that to myself. I, this is the voice of the soul speaking. I could tell the quality of this encounter. I don't know, you just know, you know, I've studied religions all my life I've, to, in order to know what those encounters are like. I, I compare it to the Annunciation paintings everywhere where the angel tells the Virgin what she's going to be. And she, she says, okay. And uh, I, I feel that, I felt that in that moment. It was, in other words, it was a theological moment to me, and it's about my life. And appealing the decision, that language was totally inappropriate, it didn't fit anywhere in my theological understanding of the moment, if you follow me. And uh, so that turned out then to be a very valuable guidance for me, this person speaking to me, saying, you are not going to teach here any longer. That was extremely disappointing. I can't tell you how disappointing it was, but it was probably the best message I've ever received in my life. It gave me my life. <laughs> so uh, it's tricky, you know, you say, how do you, how do you know when the soul tells you what to do? I think you have to be open to it. I've, I've done a lot of reading about it. I've I've made a point of studying Annunciation paintings all around the world, wherever I go, I look at Annunciation paintings. That's the first thing I look at. I can tell you some great ones at the Isabella Gardner's Historic Garden Museum in uh, Boston. What great, uh, wonderful Annunciations there, but they're all over. And they tell you that an angel may come and give you the word for your life, what you're going to become, what you're going to be. I think that's what those that, that that theological mystery is 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 about, at least in relation to our own lives. So that's how I feel. That's how I think. It's weird, perhaps, for some people, but that's how I think, and uh, and that's why I, that's how I can follow the soul. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thanks, David. Uh, 
Okay, unmute. That was such a brilliant or wonderful. This whole thing has been absolutely moving to me. And I don't know whether I can even meet it with another question. But I do wonder if you want to just conclude with any words about this uh, life uh, effort of learning to love and be loved. Yeah, that's a big one. Well, it's such a deep thing, you know, eros and psyche, you know, so soul and love. Um, how do these things come together? Mm -hmm. uh, one idea is in, in history is that, the, that, the, the, that love leads you to a soul. And of course, another idea in history is the opposite, that the soul will lead you to love. Um, but they come together. And I think that the better way to look at it is as a twin kind of thing or two sides mm. of a coin, something like that, soul and love. Mm. And uh, I think we often literalize too much the object of our love. Uh, mm -hmm. Even the Bible tells you not to do that. You know, I often quote the Song of Songs, where it is said that uh, I, I sought him whom I loved in my bed, and I didn't find him. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great line from the Bible, Song of Songs. I didn't find him. I looked for him. I looked for him in my bed, and I couldn't find him. Uh, and the, the theme there is that love doesn't have it literal final object mm -hmm. it's object all the loves all the loves you have whether they are you know place or person or what whatever uh, alcohol <laughs> whatever your your love is it's it's there to lead you deeper into mm -hmm. further experience of love that's going to be more satisfying and deeper all the time i feel that as a married man i feel that uh, it's very clear to me that I really love my wife and still do, obviously, but I, when we got together and I thought my feeling was, okay, now the two of us, two of us are together. That's, that love is complete. Mm -hmm. And then my daughter appeared. Wow. And she's there and still here, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, it's like, whoa, this, this is, more than I bargained for. This, this love is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then uh, my son appeared. And then, you know, their partners appear. <laughs> <laughs> and, and on it goes, and there's so much love I'm finding within myself, the more capacity for love, it's getting bigger and bigger. And it doesn't diminish, obviously, it, it makes bigger the when the love that first appeared with my wife, but it keeps getting bigger and bigger and changing and becoming more satisfying in so many ways. So I think that's an example that we have to have a big vision of love. And a lot of times we, we limit it too much. Yeah. We think we know what we're looking for, but we're never, we never know. I, I, in my bed, I sought him whom I loved and I didn't find him. Got to keep that in mind. Yeah, and I think I think it'd be better off. Beautiful, thank you. <laughs> so, Thomas, we we have a uh, we're on nine o'clock. Would you like to say any ending remarks? I would. Yeah, I'd like to say something, especially since I'm speaking to people. I think I, I know some of you are from different parts of the world, but tonight, but. Uh, People, my friends in the, uh, the Western Massachusetts area that's so, so close to my heart. Um, I would uh, just uh, recommend that you, what's, what I'm picking up tonight is to uh, have an open mind as you go and an open heart as you create your, your community around Jung. Jung is a worthy person to commit to build a community around. There are dangers. There are dangers with any leader, any father, 
figure of any kind. And we've seen instances of that. I decided years ago not to become a Jungian analyst because I saw the danger. I felt there would be a danger in it, the danger of closing down some, closing some doors around me I didn't want. That's just me, not for anybody else at all, just for me, but I had to make that decision. And uh, I did. And uh, I had a conversation about this with Hillman when we first met. Uh, I, asked, uh, I asked him if he wanted to do anything in Dallas when he arrived. He said he'd like to go to a baseball game. So we sat in a car watching a baseball game, just a pickup game in a neighborhood. And um, we had a conversation and I asked him, I said, what are you gonna do about the father figure? Now you're coming here into the city and people are going to treat you or they're going to find a father in you. And he said, well, he said, uh, you see what happened to Jung. You know, he got a lot of children that some of them can't get too much distance between themselves and him. And he said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be a father figure to anybody. And I said, oh, well. <laughs> that's not the way you deal with the father figure by saying I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I would recommend that you keep that open mind and heart and uh, uh, realize how valuable this soul study is, a soulful kind of study. It's not just intellectual. It is intellectual, but it is also of the soul and of the heart. And if you can uh, uh, follow that, you know, in your way, um, I really think that you're going to have a wonderful creation here. I'm feeling, I'm very interested in it, what you do. And I hope that you uh, keep this, this open heart that I have felt here tonight. And I can't, I'll tell you honestly, I have never heard such good comments and questions from any group mm -hmm. than I've heard tonight. Mm -hmm. You know, every single one, fantastic. So I think there's great promise here. Uh, as long as I'm nearby, I'm happy to contribute in any way I can. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for your wisdom and your soulful words. So, and, um, so thank you everybody for coming and please, we would really appreciate it if you would go to the, um, the chat and go to the donation button and help us out so we can bring wonderful people like Thomas to speak to us. So thank you so much. And it's hard to say goodbye. So goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Walk thank in you. beauty always. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Bye, David. Bye, Ulrich. Bye, Christian. Yes, I know. Everybody.